Horus is a 2019 hardcore platformer Metroidvania indie game. The game mostly flew under the radar, aside from a very partial playthrough on GT Live. So today, my goal is to play through this indie entry and tell you what's the deal with it. The game opens with the creation of the title character. Afterwards, he is packaged up and shipped off to the house of his creator. And with that, you take your first steps as Horus. The game then transitions into a tutorial, teaching you how to run, jump, and play the floor as lava. The whole tutorial is under the guise of teaching Horus. From here, the story is told by Horus through 22 chapters. Each chapter is essentially a level where you have a specific goal, and when you complete that goal, the chapter is considered complete. Chapter 1 is Learning to Walk, where you get introduced to the family alongside Horus. There's the old man, who is Horus's creator, the old lady, his wife, and Heather, who is their daughter, and doesn't seem to like Horus very much. There is also the professor, who is the brother of the old man, and spends most of his time locked away in his room. Then there's Mr. Deck, the professor's butler, Alice, who is the chef, and Mr. Silton. He's the old man's driver and once got busted for a post office robbery. One day, some mysterious men in black show up at the house, and the old man shows them what Horus is capable of by setting up an obstacle course. The old man also explains that Horus has something called the Lazarus Chip, which means he won't die no matter how much damage he sustains. This is pretty much just a tongue-in-cheek way of explaining why you have infinite lives. You then play through three fairly simple obstacle courses. After the obstacle courses, the men in black seem fairly impressed, but they do seem a bit disappointed that Horus isn't a kill bot, as they put it. After this, the old man and the old lady introduce Horus to music, television, and video games, which means an endless amount of pop culture references from now until the end of the game. He said he had eaten some bad magic mushrooms. Part of me wondered why he hadn't doubled in size. Blanka, said Mr. Sitton. It took a great shot. One in a million. After that, you play Pong. It's, it's just Pong. Hit the ball till you win. The family then prepares to go to the beach, but Deck and the professor stay home. Well, at the beach, Horace sees something out on the water, and the old man explains it's a ship that went down in the 1940s, and explains war to Horace. Suddenly, the two hear a scream and realize that Heather fell onto a ledge. She isn't hurt, but she is unconscious, and the tide is coming in. Horace offers to rescue her, and the game transitions into a gameplay segment, which introduces a new mechanic, carrying stuff. Carrying things changes your weight, how fast you can move, and how high you can jump. If you're carrying something particularly heavy, like a human person, you lose the ability to run. The game goes into more detail and expands on this mechanic later, but this is the first time it's shown. After this, there's a short platforming section to get Heather back to everyone else. After saving Heather, newspapers are written about Horace being a hero, and Heather likes him now. Cool. As time goes on, the old man teaches Horace about distant lands, history, and physics. One night, Horace and the old man go out to eat, and talk about Horace's purpose. The old man tells him to help around the house, but Horace is unimpressed, so the old man tells him to clean one million things. Chapter 2, Learning My Purpose At the start of this chapter, the old man installs a step-toe chip in Horace. This allows him to collect things to clean. It also allows you to see how many things you've collected, and how many things are left in the current area. These objects are similar to coins in Mario or rings in Sonic. As long as you're standing on something, you will automatically collect it. It takes slightly longer to collect bigger objects, but they are worth a bit more to compensate. After cleaning a few things, some time passes and it's Halloween. The family has a party, and afterwards, Horace is told to clean up. That is until the old lady yells that Silton is on the roof. When everyone walks outside, Silton has a guitar and says he's going to jump after this song. The old lady tells you that there are only 30 seconds left. This starts what is a pretty tense segment where you have to race up the building that Silton is on and stop him before time runs out. Once Horace reaches the roof, Silton hallucinates him as a giant robot until Horace puts a hand on his shoulder, and Silton snaps out of it. After Silton is rescued, some more time passes until the anniversary of Horace's first year, when a shoebox gets delivered. The old man takes the box and Horace into the backyard and sets a teddy bear on a high shelf and tells Horace to retrieve it. The game lets you attempt this challenge, but the bear is too high to reach. When Horace returns to the old man, something unexpected happens. However, I still don't understand what happened next.
After Horace becomes unresponsive, the family tries anything they can to get him to react, but nothing works. Eventually, the family mourns the old man's passing, and technicians come to shut Horace down. Next is an acid trip which involves a whole bunch of pop culture references, including Horace appearing in art from throughout the centuries, until... He wakes up. Horace sees the shoes and the old man's hat. He puts them on and realizes that he can now defy gravity. Adina Menzel was right. You then leave the bathroom and enter Chapter 3, My World Ripped Apart. At first I thought this was just a cheap gimmick that would make platforming easier, but I was pleasantly surprised by how in-depth the mechanic is. It's not so much this is the easier way of doing the game, it's more so you need to shift your perspective of how the world works. Like this part for example, you can't jump high enough here to switch gravity, so at first you might assume this place is inaccessible, that is until you figure out that you can walk on the wall, and because you can jump further than you can high, you can now make the jump. Puzzles like this are just littered throughout the game, and by the end, you are really in the mindset of how can I manipulate the environment to progress. At first, this seems like it would be disorienting, changing perspective all the time, and it would be, but the developers had the foresight to give Horace a necktie, which you realize the significance of when you change gravity and the tie points towards the ground. The tie is just adhering to gravity and acting how you would expect it to, but it acts as an amazing anchor. I couldn't tell you how many times I didn't know which direction the ground was in, but one look at the tie and I knew immediately. I cannot understate how useful this one little detail is. Anyway, Horace makes his way outside and from here the world opens up a lot more and you have more control over where you go. There are a couple of things to do next. If you go to the right, you'll find another house on the property with a blind man inside. He tells you that his cat is in the sewer and asks you to retrieve it. After some platforming and racing water, Horace has his save the cat moment, which is literally saving a cat, only to be confronted by his doppelganger. Apparently more robots have been created during Horace's stasis. These robots appear a lot less friendly compared to Horace, but luckily they seem to be dumbed down versions, only moving left and right. He gets past them and returns the cat to the blind man, who tells a story about how he was blinded in one of the old man's factories, and how the old man let him live on the property after that. The blind man tries to give you a box of Atlas gloves, saying that the old man wanted you to have them, but quickly realizes that the box is empty. The blind man looks upset as he tells you that he was recently robbed. He gives you the sewer key so that you can return any time and sends you on your way. From here, you can go to the left to continue the story. After only traveling a short way, you find a house that's on fire and can hear screaming. When you go inside, you find a trapped family. Horace saves the kids first, and then the wife, and then the- Yeah, no, just kidding. The husband's fine, too. After saving the family, Horace helps them build a tent. Then the husband and wife explain that there was a war, which explains why everything is in such disarray. They also tell Horace that he can use their boat to get to the mainland. After the boat ride, Horace and the player realize just how bad everything has gotten. Still not as bad as California, though. Oh! <laughs> After docking, you come to another house. When you enter this one, however, you are suddenly confronted by three masked people, only for one of them to recognize Horace and reveal himself as Silton. He then introduces Horace to the others, his wife, and his friend and bandmate, Mr. Preston. Silton then explains what happened to everyone else. Alice retired to her home in the countryside, the professor barred himself up in one of the factories, Deck became a celebrity, and Heather and her mother are working on a government compound. Silton also breaks the news to Horace that the old man is gone. After that, the group turns in for the night, and it's time for the first of many dream sequences. Throughout the game, Horace will fall asleep and start to dream. The first dream has you flying through the sky and chasing the old man before he flies off and you wake up, leading us into Chapter 4, Finding a Way Home. The next day, Silton tells you to head back to the house, since most of it was blocked off before, and you should be able to access it from the basement. Before you enter the basement, though, Silton gives you Atlas gloves that he got... somewhere. Hmm... Probably not an important detail. Anyways, the gloves are what I was mentioning before about expanding the mechanic of holding things. You can now not only hold things, but also pick them up, catch them, and throw them. With your newfound abilities, you yet again traverse the unknown parts of the house until you come to the first boss battle of the game. Nearly every chapter has a boss battle, and some have multiple, so you're going to be seeing these guys a lot. The first one is pretty simple. 
Just fire the conveniently placed electron cannons at him four times, and he goes down. The only caveat is that the electron cannons blow the power, so you have to reset them each time with the switches on the ceiling. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Now run from sentient boxes. No, really, that's the next part of the game. The old man created plenty of other robots besides Horus and the Killbot, including a swarm of nanobots that escaped from their container and now possess household appliances. And boxes. Eventually, you get past the saws and hammers and make it to the training room from the beginning of the game. Did someone say boss battle? Cause it's time for another one. The nanobots are mad that you keep beating them, so they devised a plan. They assemble into a snake using the gym equipment and chase you with it. This fight has similar mechanics to the game Centipede for anyone who's played that. You jump on the snake and pull a pin that's holding it together. This splits the snake into two, and then those split again when you pull their pins. Unfortunately, this is where the fun ends, as pulling a pin from one of these snakes simply makes it fall apart. Once you pull the pins from all the snakes, you win and can now progress. After a bit of platforming, you make it back to the main entrance, where Silton blows up the rubble, clearing the way. Something tells me he could've done it the whole time, but just wanted to watch us suffer. Horus wants to find everyone else, but Silton says to do that, they need the stolen van, so it's off to Chapter 5, Mr. Silton's Van. Horus, Silton, and Preston go to visit the house of a former associate. Silton breaks through the window with a crowbar and tells Horus to get the keys while he deals with the owner. You then go through the most home alone house ever until you get to the room where you find a key. Two keys. Fuck. So you do the only thing you can think of and just grab them all. After leaving the room, you hear a gunshot in the distance and have to race back to Silton. You burst in on the owner holding Silton at gunpoint. Silton tells Horace to stop the man. The man looks terrified and starts to run away. You have to chase him and dodge his shots until you get to the end of the hall. Once you corner him, Horace reaches for the man's gun and then... Sleep is overrated anyways. On the ride home, Horace reflects on the night and wonders if he could have done anything differently to save the man. When they get back, Preston can see Horace's inner turmoil and offers to teach him how to play the drums. Rhythm game time! Okay, in all fairness, I'm terrible at rhythm games. So any footage you see in this video is not going to be great. Rhythm games come up a few times throughout the game, and some are required to progress, but this one's just practice. You can completely fail if you want. You can also replay as many times as you want until you feel comfortable. After the drum lesson and Mrs. Silton patching up Mr. Silton's arm, Silton explains that there's one more thing they need to do before tracking everyone down. They need to break Mr. Logan out of jail. Mr. Logan is Silton's old bandmate. Horace doesn't feel great about the idea, but he knows that he needs help to find everyone, so he agrees. The three get to the prison, and Silton explains that Horace will have to deactivate the security system and then break Logan out of his cell. This mission is the start of Chapter 6. Friends aren't always what they see. The mission is interesting as it marks the first time that the game completely changes genres. This mission is essentially a stealth lull. There are guards and spotlights. If any of them see you, you better hide quickly before more guards appear to light you up. Not even dying stops the alarm, so the only way to stop it is by finding a hiding place. After sneaking your way around a little bit, you make it to the control room, and then to Logan's cell. Horace and Logan sneak back to the others. There are some guards on the way, but you get past them with the help of Logan. Right as the group is about to leave, a tank pops out of nowhere for the third boss fight of the game. This one is pretty easy. The mounted cannons are on a cycle, so jumping on the tank is all about timing. Once you get on it, there's a hatch that you have to hop on three times. From there, it's basically rinse and repeat. The first hatch is in the center, then the left side, then the right side, then in the center again. After the boss battle is over, the group makes a daring escape in what is essentially a Mock Rider minigame. Stay on the road, shoot the guards down, and don't get hit too many times, and you should be good. After that brief segment, you learn that Logan was in jail because he was drafted into the war. At first he was on board until his group was told to kill anything that moved in an area with civilian. He deserted and got thrown in prison for it. Once you get back to the hideout, it takes some convincing of Silton, but eventually the group decides on a plan of action. Horus will take a train to each area, and Silton and the others will follow on the next train in disguise. Mrs. Silton gives Horus a robot passport, and everyone turns in for the night. Now seems like a good time to have the next dream sequence. So what's this dream sequence? Remember the last one, how it had to do with the story and showed us what was on Horace's mind? Yeah, no more of that. Now it's Superman 64. No, seriously, it's basically just Superman 64. 
and it's like this for pretty much the rest of the game. I don't know why they implemented this mechanic if they weren't going to do anything with it, but it could have been interesting if they did a bit more with it. It does still change a little bit from time to time, so I'll mention those when applicable, but it's mostly just the same, which is honestly a bit disappointing. The next day, Horace and Mrs. Silton head into town to get a train ticket for Horace. Later on, you'll be able to turn in junk you've collected for money, but at this point in the game, and only this point in the game, the junk trader is closed. This is more than likely to force you into playing the job minigames. The only way to make money without Junk Trader is through these minigames, and they're all rhythm games. The first one is a brick making minigame. You're in a line and you just slap the brick in time with the rhythm. Side note, is this how bricks are made? You just slap them and it makes a brick? You learn something new every day. The second minigame is a dishwashing minigame. There are four dishwashers, one in each corner of the screen, and your job is to catch the plates they throw at you in time with the rhythm of the music. This was the one I was the best at, but I think it's just because it doesn't require rhythm, it's just reaction time. The third and final minigame is the post office. This one gives you a red stamp and a blue stamp to stamp packages. It's pretty simple. Red to red, blue to blue. There's also a bit of a curveball with a cat that comes down the conveyor belt occasionally, and obviously you're not supposed to stamp the cat, but I swear the cat is like a stamp magnet. I stamp the cat almost every time, and not on purpose. I would wait till the cat was well past the stamp, and it would still get hit. Anyway, these minigames have three difficulty levels unlocked from beating the previous difficulty, and higher difficulties do give you more money, but it's not nearly enough to be worth it. My advice, just play them until you have $1,000 for a train ticket, and then leave. This will unlock the Junk Trader, and he'll give you more than enough money. Additionally, the town contains a shop, at which you can buy items and upgrades. There's also an arcade where you can play various games. Once you buy the train ticket and board the train, you have three options. You can head to Factory 10 to go after the Professor, sitcom to go after Alice, or head towards Big City and go after Deck. You have to go to all these before visiting Heather and the Old Lady, because Silton's plan requires everyone. You can choose these in any order you wish. I chose to go to sitcom first. Sitcom is a strange town populated by mostly 90 sitcom characters. And I'm just now realizing that the name is a pun. <sighs> Anyways, it's also populated by an amusement park called Wonderland and Alice's House on the coast. Once you enter the cottage, you are confronted by a grayscale room that leads you down, 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 until you eventually come to a room with a cake that inflates you and mysterious liquid that shrinks you. You then must traverse Wonderland, a wild place where you travel through a variety of areas, including running away from a demon cat, playing chess, running around a ball of fire, and going through a hallway in first person, showing you your deepest fears and regrets. Anyway, eventually you get to the boss fight, which is unsurprisingly the Queen of Hearts. This boss fight is pretty straightforward. You play through three minigames out of a pool of four. These games are short and simple, allowing you to collect lives for the upcoming fight. After making it through the minigames, there's one last minigame that's basically The Legend of Zelda. After you make it through the various challenges of this minigame, you confront the Queen of Hearts. Simply knock out her shield with your fire staff, and then deflect her projectile with the ice sword. Rinse and repeat three times, and you win. After the fight, Horus is crowned the King of Wonderland. That is until you hear voices and realize this is all in Horace's head while Sim, Alice's husband, is reprogramming him. Luckily, Silton and the others can stop him before he can do any real damage. You are then introduced to Sim and two other robots that he reprogrammed, Betty and Fluffers. Silton makes sure that Sim still has a security pass for the facility where Heather and her mother are. Sim remarks that Alice never throws anything away, so he should still have it. This leads us into Chapter 7, Beyond Wonderland. Whew. That was a long one. Oh well. Next up, Factory 10 and the Professor. Factory 10 is less of a town like sitcom and more so just one building. This building is also the location of the first escort mission of the game. You have to guide Silton, Preston, and Logan through the dangerous parts of the factory, including a slide puzzle, for some reason. Once you make it to the top floor, you enter the Professor's room where you find him... Oh, that's not good. Just as Horace and the others are about to leave, the Professor appears out of thin air. He's holding a strange device and asking if he's on the right day. He mentions that he doesn't have much time to explain before a force field engulfs everyone except for Silton, who backed out of it at the last second. The rest of the group is thrown through time, back to the Stone Age. Once escaping a horde of ravenous monkeys, yes, that really happens, the Professor explains to everyone that he has mastered time travel. However, the device is very inconsistent, and he doesn't know exactly where he'll end up or for how long he'll stay there. The longest he's been stuck somewhere was ancient Egypt for 15 years, where he built the pyramids, apparently. After a few puzzles and platforming segments, the professor can fix the time machine. 
The group gets brought forward in time. The professor looks around and remarks that this is the wrong time. Horace realizes that they are in their bedroom. Across the room, two young boys are in bed. One of the boys smiles at Horace, and he smiles back, before the gang is whisked through time once again. This time, the group ends up in ancient Egypt. Horace is thrown into a tomb as a sacrifice, and the rest of the group is hauled off in chains. Well, this could be going better. After a brief platforming segment to escape the pit you were thrown into, Horace stumbles upon the rest of the group, and then has to fight the boss of this area, which is the steam-powered automaton referenced by the professor earlier on. This is honestly one of my favorite fights in the game. It's probably because it's so similar to the final Bowser fight in Super Mario World. The idea is you have to throw rocks into this thing's chimney. Throw a few in there, you move on to phase 2. Throw a few more in, you move on to phase 3. Throw a few more in, and bada boom bada bing, you're done. It's a pretty simple fight, and it only took me a few tries, but I don't know, I enjoyed it. Again, this is coming from someone who grew up with Super Mario World, so it might not hit the same if that wasn't a part of your childhood, but 4 out of 5 stars. Good boss fight. Would boss again. After the fight, Horus rescues the others, and the professor boots up the time machine to get the heck out of Dodge before the angry Egyptians catch them. The group appears in a pretty nondescript room, but the professor seems pretty certain that this is the right place. He tells the others to stay where they are before grabbing a massive wrench and running into the other room. From beyond the door, you can hear gunshots, then... The professor stumbles back into the room, riddled with bullet holes, as he activates the time machine one final time to bring everyone back to the top floor of the factory, only for him to sit down in the chair and look towards Horace, giving him one final quote. Life is a state of mind. Before he dies. Afterwards, Logan tells everyone to run and hide. Preston mentions that he saw someone on the security camera, and when they hear the familiar whir and see the flashing blue light, it becomes clear that they reappeared right before they left. This closes out Chapter 7 and begins Chapter 8, The Professor R.I.P. And this brings us to my first problem with the game. It's relatively minor, but you may have noticed for the past couple of chapters that the title has been referencing the previous chapter, and this continues for a good portion of the remainder of the game. It's somewhat understandable considering the game is so open at this point, but there are other ways to do it. For example, you could have the chapter start once you pass a certain checkpoint instead of as soon as the previous chapter ends. It's not a big deal, it's just a bit confusing when chapters reference the previous chapter that is already complete. Oh well, on to deck. Like the previous two chapters having been based on popular movies like Alice in Wonderland and Bill and Ted, this chapter is also based on a film, and you could say it's an impossible mission. It's... it's Mission Impossible. This... this one's based on Mission Impossible. After getting to an event where you can enter the building, Horace is told to take off his clothes and have a blank expression on his face. That way he can blend in with the other robots. This means for the entire mission you cannot use your gravity boots. This is the first of a few points in the game where they take away the ability for you to use your shoes. And while it may seem like an odd decision at first, it actually makes quite a bit of sense in context. It's kind of like how sometimes they take away Flood for certain missions in Super Mario Sunshine. Just mixing up the gameplay a bit to keep you on your toes. Aside from this, there's not much to mention about the first section of this chapter. It's pretty much platforming without gravity shoes. You come across a scientist at one point who seems pretty impressed with his new invention. It's an upgraded robot that can be remotely controlled via satellite, but I'm sure that's not going to come up again. After platforming for a bit, you eventually make it to Deck's dressing room. Silton also gets in through the ventilation. Deck then sets off the security system, which means you're going to have to turn it off. You have to go through a few different rooms and do a few platforming segments to turn off the alarm, and eventually get them all turned off with a little bit of help from Logan. Silton subdues, drugs, and traps Deck in a coffin. From here, your goal is to get Deck out of the studio without raising the attention of the guards. Basically, another stealth segment, that also doubles as an escort mission. After you get past the various guards while trying to keep Deck quiet, you come across, who would have guessed, the scientist from earlier. This boss fight is largely the same as the others. Three phases and three hits per phase. This time, you have to jump on the satellite dish on the robot's head, and then it will run on the ceiling, where you have to use these buzzer-type enemies which fly up into the air and explode when you hit them. After the fight, the satellite dish falls off the robot's head and Horace can see the humanity in its eyes, for only a moment before the scientist comes to discipline it for not obeying his command. After all three missions, everyone meets back up at Silton's house for Chapter 9, Delivering Deck. Silton's plan is simple, and definitely not convoluted in any way. First, Sim shows up with Horace, Betty, and Fluffers, and gets in using his security pass. The guards are distracted because Deck shows up with everyone else disguised as a film crew. Since Deck is a celebrity, the guards want to talk to him. Sim and the robots can get by unnoticed from there. Horace can separate from the rest of them and find Heather and her mother. Here we have yet another stealth segment, this time with a password-locked door at the end. 
Now this is where I'm going to mention another criticism. You cannot replay these levels. Any pre-made missions are unplayable after you go through them once. I'll expand on this later and explain why it's such a problem, just for now, remember that you can't replay any of these missions once you beat them. Once you speed through the stealth segment, Horus comes into contact with the scientist from Dex Studio, where we learn that his name is Dr. Harrell, and he's kind of a dick to all robots. Luckily, Heather saves Horus, and brings him to the old lady. But before they can, Harrell stops Horus, and this leads into yet another boss fight, this time with a kill bot. This fight is largely the same as the others, with three phases. For the first phase, you have to avoid his fist slamming down. Once you do, you unscrew his chest plate and enter inside of the robot for the second phase. Once you enter the chest cavity, you have to go through a few platforming segments. And for the third phase, you have to hit his fist with one of the buzzer enemies, then have the fist slam down on top of his head. But you can't do this with the blue enemies keep getting in the way, just let me- No, 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 no. This is the worst. After a somewhat infuriating final phase, Horus meets up with Heather and her mother. This leads us into Chapter 10, getting the family back together. When the trio gets to the gates, they're confronted by a guard. Luckily, he's made short work of with a little help from Logan. The four of them then get into the van just before it speeds off. With everyone now safe, Heather and the old lady take time to explain to Horus everything that has happened since the old man died. After Horus was deactivated, the company was split among several beneficiaries. These individuals made quick work replicating Horus' mind and multiplying the amount of robots in existence. Eventually, a war started, and both sides used robots to fight it. However, the robots realized that their problem was not each other, but the humans, and so they turned on their creators. This is how the end of the world started. They also mentioned because Horus' mindset was copied to make these robots, each one of them has a little bit of his mind inside of them, and that's why the robots that you find throughout the game walk around like mindless zombies. Because when the family realized these robots had some of Horus' consciousness, they build a scrambler using that information, so any robots within a few hundred miles of the mansion would become mindless drones. Suddenly, they are interrupted as guards from the facility track them down. And then Heather dies. No, not really, Horus saves her, but they do fall off a cliff. Unfortunately, the two aren't able to make it back up the cliff at night, so they stay put until the morning. Heather takes this time to explain to Horus that her and her mother were attempting to make a type of virus that would undo the mind scrambling of the robots. And now that they have Horus, it should be much easier. She calls it the Nice Virus. Basically, it'll make all the robots a lot more like Horus. When day breaks, Preston finds the pair and helps them make it back up the cliffside. After this, Silton decides that everyone is hungry and tells Horus to go catch a rabbit. At this point, you have a choice. You can either catch the rabbit or refuse. It doesn't make much of a difference since if you catch the rabbit, Horus still lets it go eventually. The only difference is that if you chase the rabbit, you get a bit more of an inner monologue from Horus. This is the last event before Chapter 11, moving back home. And no, I didn't skim over the last chapter, Chapter 10 is just very short. And that's it for the first part of this video. Unfortunately, it ended up being quite a bit longer than I was expecting, so I'm having to split it into two parts, just so it doesn't take forever to release this video. Part 2 is already scripted and recorded, I just need to finish editing it, and I thought I would get this part out as early as possible. Part 2 should be coming out about a week after this one, and if you were watching this video at a later date, then it's probably already out. That's all for the video, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time. Bye!